In today's video, we are going to be talking about creating artwork with everyday items. And so what I have here is a couple of tea bags. Our first project up is going to be tea bags, and then we're going to do a little coffee painting. Um, so I have Irish breakfast tea, and I have Tazo passion tea. Um, this has got hibiscus in it and rose hips. So I happen to know this is going to make a red color. I have heated some water and all I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the water. So I have a clear water, a water for the English breakfast tea and water for the passion tea. And I have, I'm going to put two tea bags in each one so that I can start the process going while I talk. I know that the passion tea is red when you make it. I'm hoping it's really, really red when we paint with it. And it is turning red in the container, so that's really great. So what I have here is just a variety of art materials. I have been loving my dip brush, so I pulled it out so that I would have it. I have sort of a fluffy brush that I like to paint with because it just makes big blobs of color. I have a, a brush that I almost exclusively use just to wet the paper. I usually don't use it for paint in any way. Um, I have a pencil. I have my three favorite jelly roll pins in various sizes. I have a, um, a nib pen. It has blue ink in it. A little tiny detail brush just in case I need it. And my favorite micron pen. I will say that um, this is the thinnest of them all. I have three, five, eight, and ten. So depending on how wet or how dry something is. And then I have my 2H pencil. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to usually don't pre-draw. So I'm just going to draw like, like just sort of abstract shapes just to get us started. I really like to start like this. And then I poured some of that out because I just want it. Um, the thing that I find the most interesting is sometimes you have just a little bit of water you know, and you spill your tea. And so it leaves like, so I really want, I really want the ring that like your coffee cup or your tea cup might do. We're just gonna set that to the side. So that really did make sort of a nice pretty color. We're gonna wet, we're gonna wet it. Oh, there was blue paint in that. There's a little bit of blue from when I watercolored water the other day in that brush. I'm just going to wet it down just a little bit. And you notice that that doesn't really move that tea. We happen to know tea and coffee will stain quite a bit. So it's kind of wet. And we're going to go in with our bigger brush. And with our bigger brush, I'm going to try to get out one of my tea bags so I can have it. I love the smell of tea almost as much as I love the smell of coffee. I'm just going to kind of push it down in there. I'm going to do that with both of my bags. The red one's easier because it's got string on it. You might want to think about that. Um, so you can do a variety of things. You could set it down. Um, you could pull it through and draw with a paint bag. And that really is a pretty, pretty color. We can move that. So it gave us a really nice sort of circle.
and then we're just gonna stick them back down in there. You can move it. So kind of everywhere you set this cup, you're gonna get a nice sort of circular pattern. And I like that. I like what that does. I like that it gives me sort of infinite possibilities to how I could do something. You could also paint the bottom of your cup like that. But I'm just going to do it a couple of times to see if I can get that red color. You notice that when I painted on there with that, it kind of turned blue. I wasn't expecting that. So we've all, we've talked about this quite frequently that frequently I will start these pieces like this. If you're going to do this, be very careful that bag is a little hot. I would do it with the back of a spoon, maybe. And I sort of start these processes not having a project in mind. I really just want to see what color something is. If I don't like the page as it's turning out, I just will set it aside and let it dry and then see what it really kind of wants to be. I don't want to mess up my circles, so I'm just kind of being really careful right there. And I can still see the underdrawing that I did. There's a little too much blue going on there. So we're going to plop that one back in there. And then we're just going to draw. And I'm going to start with my, my black pen because I happen to know that when I draw, it will kind of pick up whatever color I'm drawing. We just need to get it good and started. I like how it fades out when I draw like that. And like I said, I can still see some of my pencil line. Your jelly roll pens will not work really well for this. They do not like to get wet. So don't. I've tried it numerous times and it just doesn't get wet. So what I like about using the um, fountain pen, I have the hardest time remembering that. What I like using about the fountain pen is that you can still see the mark even though I don't get the blue. Right? And sometimes you have to like give it a little juice. Especially since I got it wet. Right. And so the way that I work is I will sort of make dark make lines, add lines, make lines, add lines. And I tend to work dark to light, kind of I will go between big and small. And I'm really interested in all of my artwork in how things react to each other. Like how does something spread and what kind of look does that give me? And I think that it's the exploration of something that makes, it makes your art um, different. Like how did you how do you decide where to put something? And so you have to consider the whole page. And my page is really, really wet right now. So I'm gonna let it dry a second. And then I'm gonna give it a blot. I really want to add and see how the the red will will spill out. And it in a previous video, I was working on a big page like this, and I see sections of the page. I don't really see, um, I don't really look at it when I'm working on these abstract pieces. I see sections, like I really kind of like that section, or I really like this section down here, and I see them as different pieces. And so I'm not, I'm not tied to my, my work as being the actual whole piece of paper. Um, and so I will cut this up and use it for a smaller piece. I'm really into small pieces. 
I like the small works. And the reason that I'm leaving it and not like touching these spots right here before I blot them is it's going to give me a darker edge right there and I want that natural darker edge. That's why I'm not touching it and I'm going to leave it to blot. Because I want it to dry and stain the paper before I remove this really wet part. You can, you notice that my paper is buckling. If you were to tape this down and sponge it and let it dry tape down, you could work on it taped and it wouldn't buckle like this. It's one of those things that um, you've got to have only work on one piece at a time, which is not my style, or you only, um, you would have to have multiple boards, like multiple small clipboards. Um, and then you could, you still couldn't, you'd have to have multiple boards to be able to do that. I don't happen to live in a space I could have multiple boards. So. I have found out that that ink, that blue ink, is not always not quite waterproof. Sometimes it will smear. And like I said, I, I'm really more interested in what the paper might do what the colors, how the colors are going to react to each other. I'm really loving that pink color. And like you can go back and cover stuff up you already did and then add back to it. And look at how the brush reacts to the paper. Look at the mark that it's giving you. If we were in the garden, I would encourage the kids to play like this. And I would probably have papers already pre-done for them so that they would have something pre-started and then they could work on it. But then they would have paper they could take home and sort of play with and realize that things are, things can be playful. And um, it's the beauty of the experimentation that will get you to something. Because I really, really wasn't expecting that ink to dry purple like that. I was expecting it to stay red, not purple. So that's interesting to me. It's really, really red in the jar. Um, it could be a reaction to the paper. It could be any number of things. So we're gonna let this one dry for a moment and then I'm gonna blot it with a towel. Now, some people would use a blow dryer at this point. Um, I don't like using blow dryers, mainly because it would blow the wetness um, away. Um, I prefer to use a paper towel. And so we're gonna let it dry just a few more minutes. I'm gonna come right back to you and once it dries and show you how to blot it. Okay, so welcome back. Let this dry three or four minutes. And I just want to share that when you look at your paper towels, there is a chance that that paper towel, just like that, will leave that mark on your paper. So when you get a piece of paper towel, realize that it could leave this mark and be okay with that or find a better paper towel. So you're going to lay it down and I don't want to shift my color any. I just want to blot it and remove and you could honestly leave it to dry overnight and it would dry just fine. Um, so you notice that I'm not like wiping it up. I'm very gently pressing that paper towel on. I also turned my paper towel over because I didn't want to run the risk of it transferring. And I really love how this is turning out. It will make a beautiful base for the rest of the drawing. So we're going to have to let this dry. And in just a few moments, I'm going to come back and we're going to see what it does. All right. We are back with a dried paintings that we worked on with our, with our tea last night. Um, so I 
if you've been watching the series, you know that I'm probably not very excited about that section there that got really wet really fast. Um, and I'll probably cut this, this page down a little bit. And I'll probably just cut it in fours and just see what I can do with that little section. I might draw over into that one again. And so we're just going to work on these papers. So there was, um, this was actually paper one. And I really love that. Remember, I was drawing through it with the ballpoint pen and it was not drawing, but it was marking the paper from, of um, somewhat. It was just watering it down. And I love that. I love that the, the line is there, but it's not really there. So let me, um, let's work on this one. And then we'll just deal with the other one later. So because I did that with the ballpoint, with the ballpoint, my fountain pen, um, I'm just going to continue. I'm going to go back into it in sections. Um, we're going to make some large lines and we're going to say that the large lines are going to be the blue. And so we're just going to start. I almost don't want to watch when I do this. Just thinking about moving the ink across the paper and letting that swirl kind of go everywhere on the paper, kind of get it up into the white spots and make sure that everything is covered. Try to end together. Not like that. So, and then I actually work in layers on my paintings. I would put this pen aside and I would choose my fat jelly roll, my tin. And then we're going to go through here and I would start in the corner and I love to do this little, if you're a quilter, you know, this is stippling. We talked about this in a previous video. This is sort of my go-to fill my spot up, right? So I usually will pick a color that I have and be like all of these colors in the smallest size shapes are going to have the stippling in it. And I'm watching where they're at. And so a lot of times in abstract art, I think that people think, oh, there's no plan to this. Sometimes it's not, there's not a plan. Sometimes you're just reacting to what's on the paper. Um, you're reacting to the sections. You're kind of seeing does some section need to be, have more, does some section need to have less, but you're reacting to what's on the paper. That's what it is for me. It can be a lot of things for a lot of people, but for me, it's more of a reaction to something. If you look at my larger sculptures, you can see that it is really a reaction. Like, do I have more color on one side? Do I need to make more color? Does, do I need to have more white so the color is more obvious? Do I need to make it bigger? Do I need to take sections out? and? Um, those are all decisions you kind of have to make and you kind of make them on the fly. Um, I always wish that it was kind of in my nature to plan those, but they really aren't planned. They are planned the size wise and color wise, but sometimes they take a life of their own. So I've got a little bit of white on all of the page. I'm going to go back with my blue. I don't think I'm going to put black on this page. Like, um, if you watch the charcoal video, I decided not to put color on the page. Um, and so just like that, I'm going to decide not to put the black to stipple with um, on the page. But I do think that over here, it, we need some variation. We need a little bit of darker color, finer line to balance out the heavy on the other side. I in no way get attached to my work. Some of these lines that are just faint could actually be stippled lines. That's kind of really nice. I am not attached to my work. I'm not attached that it's going to be anything. I don't find it precious. And I think that especially if you're working on these as like studio practice, just a way to make art every day, or you're working with kids, that's an important thing to encourage them that these are not perfect forms of art. These are an expression of how you feel that day, the color in front of you, the sounds that you're hearing. Those are all really, really important things, but it's, 
it's easy for me to say, let go of the perfection. It's much harder to do. Um, I still throw artwork away. I want to look at artwork and be like, oh, that's really bad. I usually don't throw it away. I usually cut it up and collage it. But <laughs> I put it in a background for something. So you can see how I stipple this and I'm going to pull them in and I'm just taking it where lines have already faded and just adding the stippling on top of those lines. You can still see the faded line, but I'm trying to go, I'm not starting where it's already dark. I'm starting where it's kind of not great. And if you don't experiment and if your kids don't experiment, um, you don't, you stay, you, you get a little stuck, I think. I think you just get a little stuck. You have to decide what if. What happens if I do this? Will this be horrible? Will this be great? Will this be, you know, and if you're unsure about it, I don't recommend copy paper. Um, copy paper will really tear for the amount of work we've been putting in on this. I do, however, recommend, like, you know, get a mixed media sketchbook, not watercolor paper. Um, and like I said, I will flatten these back down, right? So they're flat, especially if I'm going to frame them. But it all depends on what you're going to do with it. Um, as to whether or not you flatten it back down. So I made this really kind of cool area right there. So we're just going to fill that in and stipple it. So you can see where these start to come to life. I find them meditative. I think I have discussed this before. I find the process to be meditative, right? You can go back over and stipple over top of what you've already stippled in sections. Like maybe meander. So a lot of people would go back and connect those two. I'm not going to. I don't I don't know that it, it requires that. I also use stippling to bring attention to areas. Like I want this to be a little darker so that you notice the white. And then if I'm gonna do that, maybe I go back with the white and add a little another little area. Maybe I go back and I stipple with the white next to it. I also try not to fill in, like, you notice that I didn't fill that whole section in. Or I try to, like, only go up to the edge of the line but not fill the whole section in. That's because you expect me to fill the whole section in. And you want, you want somebody to walk up to the work and be like, oh, that's not how I thought they would deal with it. And I really kind of like that nice little area that it creates. And that's kind of what you want. You want them to be able to, like... Look at your artwork and find things that are new. If you happen to see one of my sculptures, you will always see that I put a very detailed section at the very, very bottom of my artwork. And that's because I want to encourage kids to go up and look inside my artwork. And that's why I do it. And so that's, that's the delight you want to give people is you want them to walk up to something and be like, I totally didn't expect that. I totally thought that would be something different. Mine is usually a very, very shift color change. Like if the whole outside is white and then you'll look inside something into my sculptures, the whole insides will be like flaming pink or something like that. Which is a really popular color. So if you follow my art on a normal basis, you will know that... Um, these are very subdued colors for me. And I'm really enjoying it too. Like, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting it. Yes, I did go into the white because I have found that once this jelly roll pen dries, it's not the same color white as the paper. So you can actually see it if you get up close and look at it. Probably wouldn't photograph very well, but. If you're going to go over a blue area, you want to make sure that ink's dry. It'll pick up into your jelly roll pen. You'll smear it everywhere. So this is how I would work on this one. And I think that it really is kind of nice. 
I think that it has great possibilities to be filled in. To fill in a page this size, I would probably guess that it, it would take probably three or four hours to really fill this in. That's why I work on the smaller ones because then I can set a time limit for an hour and work for an hour and know that that's where I was going. And so we talked about this one, but I didn't like it. So we're gonna cut it in half. The other thing that was really interesting about it is when I was painting it, I wasn't paying attention. It actually has a painting on the back. So we're gonna ignore that painting on the back. We're gonna cut these into the small squares because especially this one, because I don't like this one. I think we talked about it. So let's work on that one. I'll show you all of them. There's that one, which I really, really like. So the ones that I really enjoy, I probably will do those last. Um, just so that I get warmed up and I have a feel for the painting. But remember this is the brown is an Irish breakfast tea and then the blue is actually um, passion tea which has hibiscus in it and I thought it would stay pink and it turned like a violety color where it meets the other colors turned so here's what we have and this is the one that I really really love and so we're going to set this one aside to work on later. And so I really will stack them in order of I kind of like them um, just because. <laughs> so I just want to show you, I left the ink sitting out while these dried. You could go back and add ink. Right, and set it aside to dry, and then we're gonna add. See, when you get that little timid, like nervous feeling, like I just sort of stopped talking because I was like, oh, I really kind of like this one. Do I really want to add that to it, knowing that it might not do what I want it to do? And and then I stopped because I I don't want to get attached. I don't want it to be precious to me. I don't want, especially these little studies like this that I probably really don't like anyways. And I think that it's okay to not like your work. Kids, if you're listening, it's okay not to like your work. It's okay to think to yourself, oh, that's really not nice. That's really not, not my best effort. I could do so much better than that. And that's okay. That's okay to think that. Um, Now I'm really curious. I wonder if it'll stay. That has faded out nicely. I know that's gonna fade. Um, so the other one I said, remember, I wasn't adding anything else to it. I have got my fabulous um, avocado ink, which I love. I still am not gonna add black to it because I think that black would be too much. But I think that the avocado ink is just what we need. Let me let this dry for just a second and I will be right back with you. All right, welcome back. I actually blotted that little section so it would dry. There is a trick. When I tilt, when you see me tilt my pen up, I'm moving the ink down those. Um, it's got like, um, let me see if I can get it in. There it is. Um, it's got like these little grooves in it and the ink 
fills up those little grooves. And so when you see me tilt it down, I'm kind of just moving the ink down a little bit. Sometimes it moves down by itself. Sometimes it needs just a little bit of help. I really love that that's staying kind of red. It's not turning blue yet. I'm hoping that it stays that color. Fingers crossed. And you never know when things change. I do a lot of abstract pouring. And um, I will tell you that you can have just this absolute beautiful painting and then walk away and let it dry and come back and it's totally shifted into something else. And when you work that way, you kind of learn to be like, Okay, well, I'm okay with that. It's going to have to be. I'm either going to be okay or I'm going to paint over it. And painting over things are perfectly fine. You just got to let stuff go sometimes. No, I'm not a fan of those. So when I do sections like that, I'll either wipe them out with my finger or I'll paint over them. Hmm. And so I've added uh, quite a bit of ink on this side, avocado ink. And so I need to like fill it out. Um, I don't think that will dot. So you're just gonna like balance it. So everything is not heavy on one side. It doesn't look like you thought, oh, I'm just gonna do this section and not do anything else on here. And you see me, I turn my work frequently. That's so that when I'm looking at it, it gives me a fresh perspective. I turn my paintings over all the time too. I think that if you watch me work, you notice that. I'm interested to see this, if this is going to turn color. I'm doing this one wider because I know that I'm going to go back with the white. I'm going to fill those little sections in. Okay, so let's go back with my white. See if this is dry enough. So I've learned that with my pen, if it's not dry enough, if my paper is not dry, my pen doesn't work. And you'll see this. This is the thin one. Let's try this. It also doesn't make a great thick line. There. I really like the tin for the best part. I think the five works great, like if you're on black paper. You get this really great line, but I really like the, the 10 the best. And I bought these in a set. I like any big box store, order them off Amazon. And I often wonder if they come in different colors. I've never looked. I've always just ever bought the white ones. So maybe today I'll look. So I really just decide that I'm going to put the redrawing on it over sections that I want to draw attention to. Not so much I want to draw over them, but I want you to really look at this section. I want there to be something that draws your attention to the section. And so see, it, it's blank right here, so I have to decide what to do. and I. That's where I made that sort of like mistake when my pen blobbed. And so I will always tell you guys they're not mistakes, they're problems to solve. If you take classes with me, the kids all know that phrase. So I don't like the word mistake very much. I would prefer you tell me, oh, I have a problem. <laughs> it's usually what they learn to say, oh, I have a problem. <laughs> so. Think about that next time you think, oh, I've made a mistake. No, you've made a problem. Problems can be solved. They're not the end of the world.
well, some problems could be. So I would just continue to work down this one and I really am gonna keep it in that colorway. Let's bring it up a little closer so you can see what I was doing. There you go. 